going to give you one and in our chat box, I want you to enter one word. If you enter more than one word, your computer will freeze up and you'll get kicked off, but just one word. And that one word is going to be, you know, a, a bit of a reflection on this year, which what a crazy year it has been. If you're an elected official or if you're involved in government or public policy, uh, this is this is one that's going down in the record book. But I'm looking for one word uh, that can sort of describe, you know, what opportunity looks like to you for Iowans. And so just just type that word in the chat box here, and you're going to see a little bit of a, a we'll have a word cloud that'll come together at the end. But uh, yeah, it, it, it has been an incredibly crazy year. Uh, we're not even talking about the pandemic. <laughs> you want to add that to it? A little civil unrest and a, a country on the almost on the verge of a depression. But uh, that's why this board is an incredibly important board. Uh, the, the, I'm on this board because some of the people that, that, that are on it are people that I've looked up to for many, many years as the leader here in Iowa when it comes to being the expert on a, a certain type of public policy. And not only that, but they are uh, demonstrated their compassion and their integrity. And uh, for me, when I have a question about, uh, you know, what, you know, when it comes to policy, uh, there's a couple of people here in the state that I can always reach out to and know that I'm going to get an honest answer from. And uh, uh, that's why Common Good Iowa you know, that's what we're all about. You know, a bipartisan group of Democrats and Republicans and independents, but all, all people that are trying to move uh, the state in the right direction to make it an inclusive place uh, with, with strong public structures. And uh, we're children and families and clean air and clean water uh, are important. And so uh, those are, uh, th th that's why we're here today to sort of to actually celebrate uh, the merging of these two organizations uh, into common good. And uh, uh, today I want, you know, I want to hand off to Ann Disher. She is our, uh, she's the executive director of Common Good Iowa. Uh, she's going to uh, provide you with a welcoming and give you some exciting news about our new logo. And uh, uh, please feel free, you see this check box here if you have any questions, uh, we're monitoring it. Throw your question in there. I see some words coming in. Bruce, Bruce Hunter, you've got one in there, you know. Uh, Sharon Willie Steckman, I see you. Good, good, good out there. But uh, we're incredibly thankful that you guys took the time today to join us at this exciting moment. And with that, uh, let's let's show the slide of uh, our our uh, our host. And our sponsors, can we get that sl slide up there? Because we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for you folks. And uh, I'd like to read the names of the hosts, Charlie Bruner, Amy Welch, Sarah Clark, John Thomas, Roxanne Conlin, good to see you again, Liz Garst, Fred and Charlotte Hubble, Paulson Electric, Tyler Olson here in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And uh, I also want to thank the founding donors, uh, you know, who have gotten donations to us. You'll always have time to get uh, uh, to, to get those donations to us. Uh, and with that, I want to turn it over to Ann Disher and our executive director. Thank you, Dale. Thank you so much. And I want to set second Dale's thanks to our event hosts and sponsors and to all of our founding donors. Um, we also have elected, this is the thank you part of the, of the, the session, very exciting. Um, we have some elected officials joining us, um, State Senators Joe Bolcom, Claire Selsey, Eric Giddens, Pam Yoakum, Amanda Reagan, and Herman Kornbach, welcome. And welcome to representatives Marty Anderson, Michael Bergen, Molly Donahue, Chris Hall, Bruce Hunter, Chuck Eisenhart, Mary Masher, Mike Sexton, Sharon Stuckman. Thank you so much for what you do crafting policy for the people of our state. 
we have members of the board here. Um, the Board of Common Good Iowa is actually composed of members coming from the Child and Family Policy Center and the Iowa Policy Project Boards. You've met Dale, and you'll be hearing from our chair and vice chair later in the hour. I want to tell each board member how grateful I am, and I know my colleagues at, this, at Common Good Iowa are for your leadership. And I know we have all of our staff on the line today, too. I am so honored to work with these humans who are so talented, so smart, kind, and who've worked so hard to see this merger through. And finally, I wanna thank everyone on the line for joining us. I was thrilled to see as the registration list of friends and partners, former staff, former board members, and all kinds of fellow travelers grew over the last few weeks. We're really excited to have you here or what passes for here these days as we officially launch our new endeavor. Um, before we dive in, though, I do want to acknowledge that we're celebrating in the context of the terrible toll that COVID-19 has taken on our state. Um, on behalf of everyone at Common Good Iowa, I am sending our thoughts to Iowans who felt the brunt of the crisis, whether in the form of lost jobs, missed education, strained human connections, and of course, the loss of loved ones. May we all find some solace and relief in the upcoming year um, and a vaccine. Um, today, we want to officially introduce ourselves to you as Common Good Iowa um, and spend a moment talking about what it will take to advance opportunity for every Iowan. So the first order of business is really the why of our merger. Um, there's lots of practical reasons for two organizations with a long history of collaboration to join together, but our merger is really about more than practicalities. Um, it's this, no Iowan is a single thing, a healthcare consumer, a Medicaid enrollee, a preschooler, a college student, a taxpayer. Um, most Iowa parents are workers, many workers are parents. Every Iowan breathes the same air, drinks the same water. The services and structures that our state provides or does not provide, they are serving or not serving the very same people. So we are merging because together we think we can craft a unified vision and agenda that reflect Iowans as complete people with a complete set of needs and hopes and dreams. Um, Common Good Iowa will build on our collective tradition of sound research and data. In the merger process, we heard again and again from our partners that that's what they need and want and expect from us, and it will continue to be a core component of our work. But we think a merger will help us do more than that. It will enhance our ability to craft a proactive agenda, agenda to prioritize and energize the public to action. It will enhance our ability to engage our partners and build relationships. It will enhance our ability to promote policies that advance equity and meet the needs of the Iowans who are situated the farthest away from opportunity. We are living in a challenging moment you know, we're lucky to be hearing later in this hour from Lori Bellin and Todd Dorman, and I am pretty sure they're going to make these challenges, at least the ones that involve the state capital, fairly clear. <laughs> um, but I'll note that the name of this event, Moving Forward Together, reflects what we think it will take to further a people-centered people agenda in the midst of a public health disaster, an economic crisis, and a challenging political landscape. We are so pleased to work hand in hand with all of you on the line here today to meet the challenges ahead. So now the fun stuff, I get to show you our new logo and I'll wait for it to come up. Here's our new logo. Um, and I wanna tell you a little bit about what it means to us at, at, at the risk of <laughs> <laughs> too much self-analysis, but um, because we think that the values it demonstrates are the values we want to demonstrate in our work every day. So we chose color and typography that are bold and accessible, and we love those dots. Um, dots are a way to share data, right? There, You find them on a line graph, you find them on a map. That's integral to our work. They also represent people, in this case, people of different sizes, different colors. Dots can be connected. These dots are connected. They're intertwined. We hope that this logo really tells you something about who we are. And if we have your mailing address, and an easy way to assure that we have your mailing address, if you haven't, is to sign on as, as a donor, um, you will be re receiving some swag in the next week or two so you can help us represent. So I have one more piece of show and tell. Um, thank you for putting your ideas about the principles needed to advance opportunity for all Iowans in the chat. So now I wanna show back to you what you said. 
I love it. <laughs> um, here are our collaborative ideas in a, in a word cloud, which we will also be happy to share out um, after the event. I see some really strong themes. I think I see equity overwhelming. I see justice, inclusion, fairness. I see compassion. I see uh, solidarity, coalitions. Um, I personally will take a lot of inspiration from this. I think we will find ways to, to, to um, display this <laughs> um, in a virtual way anyway, way for us. Um, it shows the values that really I think are gonna be behind bold policies for Iowa. So now we will get on with our agenda um, and I am gonna introduce Nick Johnson. Nick is with the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities in Washington, DC. Nick oversees the State Priorities Partnership, which is a network of state groups, including Common Good Iowa, um, that works to influence tax, budget, and related policies to foster a more equitable and prosperous society. The center is a longtime partner and supporter of both of our previous organizations and has made available to us incredible expertise and resources to make this new organization possible. Nick, many thanks to you and your center colleagues for your support and thank you so much for being here today. Thanks, Anne. So, thanks so much. For, I'm, I'm honored to be here. I'm just thrilled. And First of all, you all should know, uh, I come from a long line of pride, proud, proud Iowans. Uh, my father, Richard Johnson, grew up in Webster City. Uh, my grandfather, Cecil August Johnson, was from Stratford, Iowa. Uh, he was a proud Henry Wallace Democrat. So, you know, I've always gotten special, special joy from opportunities to work alongside you and uh, for you, Charlie, and that amazing team at the Child and Family Policy Center. And of course, with, with Mike and Peter and David and the other great folks at Iowa Policy Project, uh, it's always been just a lot of fun to, to, to work with you and, and you've done some amazing work over time. I think this new launch really couldn't come at a more critical moment. Uh, as 2020 draws blessedly to a close, the importance of this new work, this of Common Good Iowa has never been more obvious. We can't get to a nation where everyone can afford the basics, where opportunity is no longer limited by one's race or ethnicity or neighborhood, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, immigration status or class, and a nation where crises don't further entrench racial and economic justice. You know, we can't get to that nation without robust and immediate and long-term policy advances at both the federal and state level. As Ann mentioned, Common Good Iowa is now part of a nationwide network of state policy organizations, the State Priorities Partnership, that in state after state, we're rethinking how to drive these big long-term policy changes. And we're gonna to have to do it by bringing every justice tool that we have and can develop to this effort. We're gonna need well-researched, far-sighted policy agendas that inspire us to think about what's possible that are developed in deep partnership with the communities and families who have most at stake in our policy debates and that are framed in compelling narratives that, that really articulate what makes our states great and, and lift up our hopes and our dreams for our communities. Uh, I know it takes a pretty special group of people to come together around a new vision and, and create a new organization I just wanna say how impressed I am and how in awe of the staff and board and all of the supporters of Common Good Iowa. And I'm so excited to work with this new organization as you all lay the groundwork for what I know can be big change in Iowa. Uh, I just know that my grandfather, where he's still around today, he would be so thrilled about this work. So thank you all. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Anne. It's been great working with you. And thank you, Nick. Uh, I am Mike Owen. I'm the Deputy Director of Common Good Iowa. I would like to echo Anne's comments about how wonderful it's been to work with the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities staff through the years. Uh, so thank you again, Nick. And through this transition of our organizations, you know, it strikes me as I'm sitting here that a lot of you on this call know some of us, 
And some of you know all of us. And our goal here is to make sure that all of us know each other. Um, and so Anne noted the importance of promoting a people-centered agenda. And I think that that is central to this. Uh, we know that a people-centered agenda can mean a lot of things to a lot of people, but that's really the point. A true people-centered agenda will bring people behind, together behind common values and common concerns. So we can share informed ideas and solid facts and make new connections for a brighter day for Iowa. As Ann suggested about our logo, we need to connect the dots to promote a common good agenda. A policy roadmap, roadmap to that common good agenda for Iowa necessarily includes several destinations that have been priorities of our past organizations since Charles Bruner and David Osterberg founded them many years ago. These will remain as our priorities as we move forward together. And don't be surprised, by the way, if you see Charlie and David now and then as well. David, in fact, is still on our staff. So, and an Iowa that works for every Iowan will address key areas for public policy. So this is our policy roadmap. One, one includes that we have to ensure the well-being of children and families, and especially getting a spotlight on those who are missed in our current systems. How can we reach them or reach them better? We need to raise revenue equitably to support public services that benefit every Iowan. We're all in this together and revenue is key to those services. Next, Iowa needs to change course and promote fairness and safety in the workplace and living wages for all Iowans. We know that changes like this don't just happen. We need strong public policy to reinforce not only protection of all Iowans, but opportunity as well. And finally, we need to invest equitably in clean air and water and sustainable energy solutions. This is essential for public health now and for a healthy future for all Iowans. Some in our state simply are not in a position to be able to protect themselves. And that's where our common good focus comes in. Everyone needs to be at the table to recognize the challenges we face and to find solutions. So probably everyone on this call has specific ideas to include in those areas. We're betting that you will find connections to your priorities with those of others who are with us today. And those connections can lead us to that true people-centered agenda for the common good of Iowa. We're excited about this new approach to working with all of you on these priorities and helping us all move forward together. So next, let's hear about some ways that you can make sure we are effective. We are going to go now to a two minute video from some of our partners and supporters. The Child and Family Policy Center and the Iowa Policy Project have joined forces to create Common Good Iowa. For a long time, Iowans have benefited from the smart leadership of these two organizations. They have fought tirelessly to bring the concerns of working people and the well-being of kids and families to the forefront of Iowa public policy decisions. That, that research comes from our values and that, that we know that the people who develop that, they understand they understand what the common good is. We know that the best policy is made when groups come together from across issues. And we've been proud to do that in the past with the Iowa Policy Project and with Child and Family Policy Center. So we're very excited to continue that work going forward with Common Good Iowa. They will be super strong advocates for Iowa's children, Iowa's families, and this is so critical because the decisions made at the state and local level the policy decisions directly impact the quality of lives and the potential for opportunity for our families. I love having facts and figures and analysis that can help us really decide how to proceed forward and 
This kind of research is super important, and I am so glad this group exists. The future of Iowa and the country's children requires a new level of action and investment. I know Common Good Iowa will be up to the task. Uh, yet to reach its and Iowa's potential also will require our active support. I hope you will join me in both committing to Common Good Iowa and contributing to their influence and impact. Iowa has a lot of challenges ahead. COVID-19, economic recovery, and climate change. We need Common Good Iowa now more than ever. Let's all continue to do our part to sustain and grow their important work. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that video with us, Mike. It is such a joy to hear from our friends and our, our partners. Thank you. Um, and I, I, a special um, thank you to Mike for being such a terrific co-conspirator <laughs> throughout this merger process and, and moving forward as well. So our common, our common Good Iowa team is bigger than it used to be, but we're still mighty but small. Um, and we are stronger working collectively with our partners around the state. And so that video really is, is, is really special for us. Um, we are also stronger with the financial support of Iowans who share our goal of advancing opportunity for every person in our state. So we, uh, we invite you to join us in that effort. You can make a donation in two ways right now in real time. This is very high tech for us. So we're very excited. Um, first, from your phone, you can send a text to the number on the screen. That number is 833-630-0077. In the body of the text, you just type Iowa and the capitalization does not matter. We, we tested it. Um, it will take you to a donation form where you can make a contribution to power the work of our new organization. So if you're not into the phone, if you're happier on your computer, you can certainly um, access the same form that way. You should leave Zoom running. Please don't leave us, we're, we're, we're not done yet. Um, and click over to your browser and go to the web address on the screen. That's our, our brand new shiny website uh, up and running just today. And it's www.commongoodiowa.org. And to get to the donate page, you add to the end of that donate. So www.commongoodiowa.org slash donate you will find that form where you can make a contribution. So now I'm going to pause for an awkward moment for you to get where you need to go. Um, we can really do this in real life, um, real life time. So we'll pause for a moment and look at like you look at those connections. Again, the phone number is 833-630-0077. And the website is www.commongoodiowa.org slash donate. If you're having any um, questions about how to do this, it's uh, happy to have you drop a question in the chat. Um, and we'll just uh, give everyone a minute to get that going before we go on with our agenda. I feel like we need some snappy music in the background. We didn't get that to happen. All right, well, hopefully you've all at least found your way in the direction where you need to go. Um, so I'm gonna turn the turn our agenda over to uh, to Mike. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna intervene, intervene. So I see in the chat, someone said, do you accept checks for old fashioned folks? And of course we do. And um, we uh, can drop the email. We'll drop our mailing address in the chat and you'll also see it in our follow-up information. Thanks. And that mailing address also is on the new website, so you can find it there too. So uh, thank you. And if you weren't able to make a donation just now, no worries. We will follow up with those links as we go on here and afterward. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce our speakers for the afternoon. Laura Bellin is the editor of the Bleeding Heartland blog and Todd Dorman is opinion page editor and columnist for the Gazette in Cedar Rapids. Um, almost everybody in the call I'm sure is 
familiar with their work. The, both Laura and Todd are treasures in our local media landscape and are here today to give us their take on, on what that looks like for the state, what the state policy landscape is, what it will take for uh, all of us to make progress in that landscape. So please put your questions into the chat as they are speaking and we will, uh, we will take the questions that we are able to do. Uh, in the meantime, Laura and Todd, welcome. We've certainly alluded to some of the challenges facing us in this policy landscape, and I know you'll talk about those. But to start out, I'd, I'd really like for you to, to start by talking about where there might be some room for progress. Where, where can people take some steps forward and uh, what is it gonna take for that to happen? Big and small, uh, near term, long term, what do you think? You, you're stumping me. I, I tend a little bit toward pessimism, but I'm gonna try to look on the bright side here. Uh, first of all, I just wanna say thank you so much for the invitation. As a political reporter, I, I like talking to, to hacks sometimes, but wonks are truly like my people. So I really have always valued the work of the Iowa Policy Project and the Child and Family Policy Center. So I'm excited to see what comes out of Common Good Iowa. It's really valuable for those of us who are trying to report on that really dig into policy issues. But I would say one area where there could be some room for progress in the upcoming legislative session would be child care. I mean, certainly there are people in both parties who feel that it's important to improve access to child care and uh, maybe even people who understand the cliff effects that uh, you've written about so much over the years. And so I would say that that's an area where maybe there could be some progress. Hi, I joined Laura in thanking you for inviting me. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with her 100% on childcare. Uh, I'm hoping that, you know, mental health funding would be another area where maybe we could find some agreement. They set up a, a children's mental health care system a couple of years ago and have yet to to fully fund that, that new system. There are also, of course, funding needs in, in the existing system in the regions and, and, and elsewhere. So, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the governor proposed sort of the invest in Iowa plan. That's the, the big sales tax and the tax cut and uh, mental health funding. And part of that was to replace uh, local property tax dollars that pay for mental health with state dollars that would be more stable, according to the governor. But we didn't really find out whether that was gonna mean new money for the system or whether it was basically just gonna be a property tax cut. So that's, uh, you know, the hope is that they'll find some new dollars, although the, the budget may, may be sort of tight. Okay. So um, again, if you, have, if you have questions for Laura or Todd, please put them in the chat and we'll get them. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to uh, throw you another one. How about, um, what, what are the, any surprises that you see? What are some things that may be under the radar as we sit here a little over a month to the start of the legislative session that um, people aren't talking about, but things that you are concerned about? Well, I don't know how much it's on, it's probably not under the radar for this group, but it, I don't think it's widely appreciated that there are a lot of Republican legislators who wanna pass what they call like a work fair type of requirement, um, tying uh, work requirements to public assistance. And with the Republicans retaining a very large majority in the Senate and expanding their majority in the House, I'm pretty concerned that the guardrails are off um, the leadership of the Iowa House Human Resources Committee has changed. And I know that the past chair of that committee, she's now moved over to the Commerce Committee with Shannon Lundgren. And so Ann Meyer, who's a nurse, I really don't have a great read on her on where she is on that issue, but I think it's something that it could be, um, you know, it could be an unpleasant surprise during the legislative session. I mean, I feel like every year, they come up with something, you know, in 2019, I had no idea that it was even possible to change the judicial selection system without a constitutional amendment until a few weeks before the 2019 legislative session. And I really wasn't expecting Mid-American's attack on solar energy that year either. So <laughs> I feel like 
Um, you know, there could be a tax on net metering. That's always something I'm concerned about for energy policy. I haven't heard of any specific rumbling on that, but, um, and of course, I'm, I'm always concerned about redistricting that happens in the year after the census. So uh, that'll be something I'm watching closely during the legislative session. Yeah, I'm still a little worried about that they're not that they're not through with the judicial system. That they'll think up some new ways to sort of put a thumb on the scale, and then you know, on you know, as they plan to pass various uh, regulatory reforms and things that might that might end up in the courts. Uh, uh, it, it, it's also one that a lot of people are talking about is you know what's going to happen to the bottle bill. I think it's sort of become uh, the belief that that's always going to be around and what we've seen with the pandemic now that grocers have opted out of it or were allowed to opt out and now Fairway for one is opting out even though that the rule has been put back in place. So it's, uh, we, we could see the grocers get their way and it may be that the bottle bill, you know, that you can only go to redemption centers, which will leave a lot of places in Iowa with no place to take cans and bottles back. But uh, that's gotten stuck before, but we could see movement on that. So those are those are a couple of things, and I'm always I'm also worried always about uh, what they might do to voting, how they might change absentee balloting, uh, how they might, you know, make changes. I mean, I, I didn't anticipate that they were going to come back in June and make it tougher for the for the uh, Secretary of State after a record turnout primary to to send out absentee ballots and to put the legislative stamp on that, and they may also look at the governor's powers, because some of them are mad about the things that she's done under the COVID-19 pandemic. While many of us think she hasn't done enough, some of those Republican lawmakers think she's gone too far. Okay. Well, we are st starting to get a, a bunch of questions. We're getting a lot of them about uh, uh, early childhood education and child care. So that was mentioned at the start of this, but could you go into those a little bit? Where do you see some possibilities for some progress, uh, especially as someone was saying, given how hard 2020 has been for families with young children, what's the prognosis this session for early childhood work? Well, I mean, I hope at least we've progressed beyond where we were 10 years ago, where the incoming governor Branstad wanted to eliminate the state's preschool program. I don't think that there's going to be support for something that drastic in the Republican caucus. I think that there, people broadly recognize that early childhood education is important. Uh, but again, I don't know whether they're going to put the dollars behind that. I would like to see an expansion of the state program, but I just, I, I don't know. I haven't heard anything specific that people are working on uh, on a proposal on that. But I would hope at least that Republicans wouldn't want to take us backwards in that area. Yeah, they they may end, you know may end up listening to whatever uh, the business community has to say on this because they're a lot of the, the chamber of commerce groups are very much in favor of doing something about child care, whether it be maybe there's some tax incentives for businesses to, to uh, create or contract with child care. Uh, I mean, one area I, I haven't heard anything about, but uh, wonder whether might come whether it might come up as maybe some regulatory changes that might make it easier to set up a child care or might, uh, you know, reduce some of the licensing standards. That would be pretty controversial, but I've, I've heard lawmakers talk about that in the past that it, you know, some of those rules impede people from setting up home daycares and things like that. So, uh, but I think, I think Democrats would probably like to see expansion of the state program and, and maybe some, some form of funding that it would allow for better pay for child care workers, because that's a big, that's a big problem is the turnover and, and the difficulty of finding employees, especially during a pandemic. One question in here, what's more important to our common good than clean air, water and climate? So do you see any possibility for bipartisan policies to make any significant difference with these issues? And not, not with a legislative composition that it is right now, honestly. I mean, if Democrats were in control of one chamber, then I, it could be possible that some kind of grand bargain could be struck. Like in, in 2013, when the Democrats had control of the Iowa Senate, there, were, there was a, a, a big push for 
The Republicans got the commercial property tax cut they wanted. The Democrats got the Medicaid expansion and Republicans also got relaxed um, regulations on homeschooling. But something like that is only possible if there's divided government. So I just think it's gonna be really hard. I think we're gonna be on defense on, it, on a whole range of environmental issues for the next couple of years. Yeah, we'll have to watch to see if the, uh, you know, if the Farm Bureau comes back with another version of the bill they had last year that stoked a lot of controversy that would make it more difficult to, to donate land for public use. Uh, they, they, they caught a lot of hell for that and, and backed off, but that's still this idea of, of restricting the ability of people to donate land and put it into public use is still a priority for the Farm Bureau, at least the last I, I checked. Uh, but as far as major environmental legislation, I mean, they're, they're not gonna look at the master matrix to change the way hog confinements are scored. They're pro the governor's got the bill that would fill the trust fund with a sales tax. I don't think there's gonna be a lot of appetite for raising the sales tax on either side of the aisle with the economic conditions we're in. So I don't think that trust fund is gonna get, is gonna get filled this year. Uh, so, I mean, I, I, I agree with, with Laura. I, I think it'll be a defensive stance to keep funding from being further cut and, and I've, I, with, there, there are fewer impaired waters now, which doesn't mean much because of all sorts of different factors, but that may be an excuse used by lawmakers to say, look, we're improving, let's, let's not mess with anything. But I just hope they don't roll stuff back. Okay. So uh, COVID has shown that uh, workers are incredibly important to our society, especially those in, in what have been considered essential positions. Um, how can we elevate workforce issues, you know, from safety to pay, to really recognize uh, the concerns uh, for workers, uh, as we hope that there will be attempts for recovery? I mean, will recovery wind up being um, things that help business and not workers, or will there be a will there be a uh, more level approach to this? Well, I think if you look at what's what was done to the workers' comp program a few years ago, I mean, I think we'll see more along those lines. I mean, protections for businesses, things that employers want, and I don't really expect anything to happen on worker safety or workplace protections. I mean, I think it would be valuable for, um, I mean, a, an overhaul of Iowa's OSHA is in order, but again, I don't really see this administration or this legislature taking that on. Uh, it's really outrageous how little the state does to enforce even the meager uh, worker safety rules we have. Yeah, it would be nice if if OSHA could, you know, show up at a meatpacking plant that's having a COVID outbreak and at least take a look around instead of sort of taking the business owner's word for it that, that safety measures are in place. Uh, yeah, and I mean, it's been disappointing to hear a lot of the rhetoric. I mean, when, when the... Uh, when the unemployment payments were increased during the pandemic and the idea that, you know, there were lots of people out there that weren't working because they were getting paid more on unemployment. I think that's just counterproductive. And I mean, especially at the same time, larger businesses were getting, you know, paycheck protection program loans and, and you know, maybe that didn't necessarily need it. So uh, yeah, it would be nice to have even a conversation about the minimum wage. You, you, you have a lot of campaigns out there that, you know, when, when asked, they would say, well, you know, we should have a discussion on that. Well, we haven't had a discussion in a decade. And, and that could be, a, you know, something that could draw bipartisan votes. But for some reason, that's become an untouchable issue, which is, which is odd given the state's history of periodically raising it. So, so what I'm hearing from you both is that we have a, a situation where protections are few, uh, both for safety and, uh, and pay actually, because uh, wage theft has been a big issue in our state. Oh, yeah. And at the same time, we are a low wage state with uh, the regulations relaxed. Um, there's no, there's, you're not, I, I don't hear a lot of uh, optimism that there's progress gonna be made on these issues. No, I mean, the Democrats introduce bills to deal with wage theft every year, and the Republicans just never move any of those bills. So I don't see why that would change. I mean, I don't see any appetite for that. 
how about on how about on mental health and substance abuse? Uh, do you see any progress there? Some possibilities. Well, yeah, I, I agree with what Todd said earlier. I mean, I think that there is there's at least bipartisan lip service toward the idea that we need to do more for mental health access, particularly in smaller communities. And that's something I hear all the time, every election cycle, talking to people who have been candidates, that's one of the top concerns they hear from voters. So yes, I mean, in theory, that's something where the parties should be able to come together. The mental health bill that passed a couple of years ago what did pass unanimously, but again, they didn't put a lot of money behind that. So that's going to be the tricky way. How do you, how do you fund it? And will it really be new money or will it just be shifting away from property tax to something else? What, what I'm sorry about that. The, the delivery person came at the exact <laughs> wrong moment. So my dog was unhappy. <laughs> One of the uh, one of the issues I noticed on the word cloud that was very big was equity. What do you see as a an area where there can be bipartisan agreement to move us forward on an in an equitable way in the state, where where those who don't who have not had a voice uh, may find one? Well, I, I mean, I think we saw some progress on the judicial, the, the justice reform front during the short June session at the height of the, the Black Lives Matter protests. The legislature was willing to go along and, and move fairly quickly on a, on a package of some reforms. The governor moved to you know, reinstate the voting rights of, of felons. So those were two areas of progress. I think justice reform would be a place if you look nationally that the parties could come to some agreement. Democrats are interested in it. Some Republicans are interested in it. Uh, and it's, you know, it's definitely, a, it needs to be looked at in Iowa, in particular, marijuana penalties. I mean, there's a, there's a push by Cedar Rapids and some other municipalities to decriminalize small amounts of marijuana so that they can become civil infractions and, and not draw jail time as, and, and, you know, packaged with other possible marijuana law reforms. So that would be, I think, a place where we could see progress and there may be Republicans interested in dealing, but uh, I don't know where the governor would come down on some of that stuff. She's, her position has been kind of elusive. The uh, governor's task force on criminal justice reform, which is technically led by Adam Gregg, the Lieutenant Governor, they are coming out with some recommendations that would include something to address racial profiling. But that was a, an idea that didn't get included in that bill that passed very quickly in June. So, I mean, we'll see. I, I think it would take some real, uh, the governor would have to spend some real political capital to try to get that through. And I don't know that that's going to be something she'll want to take on. Uh, so we'll see. I mean, in theory, that would be a very productive thing that the Iowa legislature could address that would advance equity. But I just, I, it's hard for me to really see it happening. Okay. Um, so one last question, do we have, um, where do you maybe see some uh, potential progress on, um, you know, the most vulnerable people in our society, people in, in mental uh, institutions or people who's, um, people who just aren't in, the, they're in the shadows. Um, how do we bring them out? How can, how can organizations like ours uh, reach out to more people to bring that issue and so many of the issues we just discussed um, out into the sunlight here? That's a great question. And I, I wish I had the answer. I know that for a lot of families, if, whether they're struggling with somebody, with somebody um, they care about has a substance abuse issue or another mental health issue. I mean, it can be something that sort of takes over your whole life, not just the person affected, but their relatives. And, and I think it's hard, although many people in that position do become advocates, it's just hard, like they often just don't even have the bandwidth to get involved in political advocacy because it's so overwhelming just trying to get the services that the, their loved one needs. 
So I think that's a really tricky question. I mean, I guess I would defer to people working more directly in that field, but I think it's important for Common Good Iowa to focus on, and I just don't know the most constructive way to make it happen. Yeah, I mean, telling the stories of the, the people in the shadows is is one way, you know, journalism tries to get at the, the you know, the conundrum about why people don't care about, you know, folks who are poor or working poor. Uh, you know, we've done lots of stories in the past and editorialized and, but I think, you know, Common Good Iowa's role in that is of course, providing us with the, the, the broader data and pointing us in the right direction on, on some of those issues. And I think it, a lot of that lobbying for those sort of things has to come from, from communities and sort of a, a groundswell of people because the powers that be are not gonna be all that interested in the normal, you know, the lobbying groups out in the rotunda that have the most pull. Not that there aren't good groups pushing for that out in the rotunda lobbyists working on those issues, but yeah, it's, it's this, that these are the issues kind of where data and journalism kind of meet and, and we put people, you know, to match the numbers. Well, thank you very much. I'm, uh, you know, we had a quick time there and, and I'm gonna turn it over to Dale to uh, close it out. Actually, I'm going to, uh, I think Anne's got, there, there's a bunch of questions here and Anne's gonna give us a little bit of background on, on our next steps with these questions, but go ahead, Anne. Yeah, well, we were gonna save the chat and we're happy to follow up and, and answer some of these questions ourselves. I did wanna to respond to one particular question that I, I really appreciated come, come through the line. And it was one really asking, in the, um, Effie Hall says, so far everything I've heard in this meeting sounds wonderful. Um, so far, I haven't heard anything that sounds remotely bipartisan. <laughs> um, how does Common Good Iowa become bipartisan when the points that have been brought mm -hmm. up so far are democratic issues? And I appreciate that question. I think it is it is the reality of, of the situation. And, and I just, you know, we are, I think the phrase we've used is are fiercely nonpartisan. Um, we work really hard to have relationships on, on both sides of the aisle. Um, and, and I think that, you know, sometimes those, those relationships are, are harder on one side of the aisle than other, but that is not exclusively true. I think, um, I think Lori mentioned childcare and, and, and Todd both as an area where we think there actually is some bipartisan support. I think, you know, I think that COVID has laid, laid bare really the importance of childcare as a, a workforce issue. Um, I think children's mental health is another issue that for us has clearly been a bipartisan issue. Um, I know in other states with a, a redder environment, um, there's been some, some real opportunities to do some things around Medicaid and particularly around um, securing longer Medicaid coverage for women postpartum, which is of course huge for, for birth outcomes and, and for women's maternal health, which we know is, is an issue um, and one with really particular equity issues. So I, I just want to, I want to acknowledge that, put that out there and, and just say that's, that's, that's our goal is, is to work across the aisle on both sides of the aisle and to, to find ways to talk about the issues we care about in ways that resonate broadly. Yeah. Thanks. I'm bounce it back to Dale. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much for that uh, insight. Uh, the, the Glenwood issue is a, a great analogy uh, Culver was uh, the governor at the time, and it was the merging of uh, a passionate advocacy. Uh, you, some of you will remember Sylvia Piper, and uh, when it came to journalism, it was Clark Kaufman that, that wrote the, the pieces that really uh, kept it on the front page of the Des Moines Register for, for a series of weeks there. And so uh, uh, with that, I want to end, end on a happy note. Let's but uh, thank you all for the, those questions. We're gonna get to those. We're gonna follow up on those, but I'd like to take a, a second and introduce to you uh, two of the leaders of our, our operation here at Common Good Iowa board, board of Directors. And these are names that are familiar to a lot of you. Uh, Lois Bunce, she's the chair of our board and was the chair of the Child and Family Policy Center board prior to our merger. And uh, Janet Carl, another name that is familiar to all of you. Uh, Janet is vice chair of the Common Good Iowa Board. Before that, she was chair of the Iowa Policy Project Board. And so Janice and Lois, uh, we're grateful for your leadership and passion and, uh, and vision on this issue. 
I'm going to turn it over to you two right now. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. I'm delighted to be here with you as we celebrate the birth of this new organization, which will promote uh, strong, vibrant, effective public policy at every level of our state. Uh, I served in the legislature with both Charlie Bruner and David Osterberg. Charlie and I co-chaired the Human Services Budget Committee, where we worked to preserve and expand needed services for children and families. And I worked with David on the Energy and Environment Committee when the impacts of farming practices and climate change were just beginning to be talked about. Through that experience, I realized that our values as Iowans get expressed not only in laws and rules, but in our state budget. What we really care about gets funded. What we don't care about as much doesn't get funded, or at least not adequately. So when David started the Iowa Policy Project, I was pleased to serve on that uh, board because I had direct experience regarding the importance of solid data and analysis as the basis for effective, fair public policy. My commitment to excellent public policy for children and families within the context of urgent environmental issues has only deepened. It's been a great pleasure to get to know the staff and board of Child and Family Policy Center and to work out a new vision and strategies for our work over the next several years. I'm especially excited by the new emphasis on honoring and supporting diversity and an even greater focus on advocacy and collaboration with partners to achieve the kind of policies that will help all our families and communities to thrive. Lois, I pass it on to you. Okay, thank you, Janet. Um, well, thank you to everyone who has um, uh, participated today and supported our, our work um, and the Common Good Iowa launch. Um, as chair of the new board of directors, I'm honored to be part of this new team and excited about our vision for the future. Um, the former boards and staff of the Iowa Policy Project and the Family Poli Child and Family Policy Center have worked really hard to make this merger a reality. And I will tell you that over the course of the last year, uh, we have um, challenged each other, we have supported each other, uh, but we always kept moving forward with this vision. Uh, we've benefited from the strengths of both organizations, uh, developed new capacities, and um, have really benefited from the expertise from state and local and national leaders and experts. Together, uh, we've created this new and important nonprofit that will play a critical role in the social, political, and economic life of all Iowans. <clears throat> like Janet, my background brought me to Child and Family Policy Center. Uh, I'm a social worker, educator, and director of several nonprofit organizations. And I've worked with hundreds of children and families uh, who want and need, most of all, hope. They want access to education and healthcare, a safe and clean environment, and a chance to succeed. And it was my work with child welfare and my interest in policy that really prompted me to get involved and to continue to stay involved. And I know that the Child and Family Policy Center and Iowa Policy Project um, work will only expand and grow because of Common Good Iowa. All of us want a strong forward thinking organization that seeks solutions through data, research, policy, that can develop successful partnerships and be a respected advocate. And Common Good Iowa is that organization. So to all who have joined us today, um, I know you share our vision for a better future for all. Uh, thank you for being our partner. And as you can see from the slide up there, please consider supporting the organization either through your advocacy or through a donation. Thank you.
Janet and Lois, thank you so much for your time. Everybody who's on this call, uh, thank you for taking your time on a beautiful Iowa afternoon. Uh, we had 160 people, which is pretty damn good. Uh, uh, so, so thank you all there. You know, I, I, I like to think I'm still a little young, but actually I'm starting to get old. But I do remember a time when, uh, irregardless of our politics, Democrats and Republicans could reach across the aisle and work together on those issues that brought us together. And we believe that by, uh, uh, by putting together the research and the data, uh, and we know it's gonna take a lot of work, but we're, we're up to it. Uh, we think that we'll be able to make that happen again. So uh, everybody have a great afternoon. Thank you, we're sensitive to your time. Have a beautiful afternoon. We'll be in touch, talk to you later, okay? I guess.